Okay, I'm Joe Calderoni. I'm the Senior VP for Communications here at South Nassau. Welcome to our South Nassau Bethpage Truth in Medicine poll uh, briefing. Uh, with me here today is uh, Dr. Warren Rosenfeld. Dr. Rosenfeld is the Chief of Pediatrics for South Nassau. He actually has uh, nearly 50 years in the field as a pediatrician on the front lines and as a physician leader. I think he's going to share with us today some interesting uh, research uh, on messaging uh, to parents uh, who are considering uh, getting their uh, children vaccinated. Also with us is Dr. Aaron Glatt. Dr. Glatt is the chairman of the Department of Medicine at uh, South Nassau. He is also a national spokesman for the Infectious Disease Society of America. Um, and we have uh, Janine Gizmondi, a registered nurse. She's also a cervical cancer uh, prevention specialist at the South Nassau File Cancer Center in Valley Stream. She sees uh, patients uh, on a regular basis uh, as well. Um, and also my colleague, uh, Dana Sandman, who's the Executive Director of uh, Public Affairs uh, here at South Nassau and is also our poll director. This is actually the eighth Truth in Medicine poll that we've uh, conducted uh, here at South Nassau. We're especially grateful to the Bethpage Federal Credit Union for underwriting the cost of the poll. We, we actually hire an outside independent polling firm uh, to conduct the poll. Uh, in New York City and Nassau and Suffolk uh, counties. And Bethpage has been very supportive of our efforts and we're very uh, grateful uh, to Bethpage for their support. Uh, the goal of the poll is, is really very simple. Uh, we go into the field and we try to gauge the public's understanding of critical public health uh, topics. Um, and we've actually, as I mentioned, have done eight uh, polls uh, so far, including topics uh, such as the flu vaccine and whether people go to work with the flu, uh, people's attitudes towards antibiotic use, uh, their uh, attitudes towards vaccines and uh, causes of autism, cancer screenings, the value of dietary supplements, uh, whether children have too much screen time on their uh, portable devices and other uh, uh, computers, and um, uh, most recently the uh, legalization of recreational uh, marijuana. Today's poll, though, is on uh, public attitudes and particularly attitudes of parents towards the HPV uh, vaccine. And uh, Dana's going to take us through the uh, actual uh, results of the Truth in Medicine poll. Hi. So again, we polled about HPV, which is a very common and potentially cancer-causing virus. And we polled 600 parents, metro area parents, so Long Island and New York City, all five boroughs, who had at least one child under the age of 18. And we polled from November 13th through 18th. The poll was conducted via landline and cell phone, 600 parents. And again, we want to know how much, how much parents knew about these vaccines that prevented HPV. And as you can see, only 25% of parents knew a lot about the vaccines. Um, and then you have 41% who maybe knew a little bit. 33% knew not much or nothing at all about the vaccines. Did parents receive the vaccine as a child? Now again, the vaccine didn't come out early enough for many parents to receive it. Only 13% of the parents we polled did receive it, 75% did not. Do you plan to have your children vaccinated? 63% of parents said they did, but a good percentage, and this is where we get the 37% of parents, were not sure or said they were not planning to vaccinate their children. So when we took that 37% of parents and broke it down, we wanted to see what the reasons were why they were choosing not to vaccinate their, their children. So of the 37% who said no, and they could pick more than one response, these were the reasons given why parents did not want to, um, were not going to vaccinate. And again, 31% of those parents said they weren't sure why they weren't going to do it. 
19% felt it was too dangerous. Uh, other reasons given were they don't think it works. They don't believe their children are at risk for HPV. They think it leads to, sex, to sexual activity. They didn't know it was for boys or they need more information. So when we, and when we look further into that, because there still is a, um, a gap in education in the, to the public about boys receiving the vaccine. People know that HPV can prevent cervical cancer, but it actually can, and Dr. Glatt and Dr. Rosenfeld will speak more to this, why boys need to receive the vaccine. But 60% of parents were aware that boys needed to receive the vaccine. Okay, I'm gonna ask Dr. Glatt to come up and just speak a little bit more. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. This is a very, very important and a very safe vaccine that is unfortunately underutilized. As you can see from our poll, there's a tremendous amount of misinformation as well as incorrect information, lack of information about the usage of this vaccine. Most of the vaccines that we give children and adults are there to prevent infectious diseases, specifically potentially fatal infectious diseases like measles, like influenza, and other very serious infections. Here we have, maybe for the first time, a cancer vaccine, a vaccination, an immunization that will prevent these children from getting cancer later in life. HPV, human papilloma virus, is a well-known cause of certain types of cancers. This vaccine has been clearly shown to prevent those children when they become adults from getting these cancers. The most common where it's been shown to be effective is in cervical cancer. But it's also effective against anal cancers, which are a very, uh, very important cancer in certain subpopulations, as well as potentially other cancers in the body that are due to this HPV. This virus is very frequently found in patients in the United States, and people in the United States. Probably one third to one quarter of people in the United States are harboring this virus. If you look at this room, you have a whole bunch of people in this room that have this virus. Fortunately, most people do not develop cancer from this virus but it is highly prevalent. The beauty of this vaccine is that it can prevent you from acquiring a number of different strains of the HPV virus, especially the ones that cause cancer. And recently, just published in JAMA in 2019, there's a study showing that there's a concept of herd immunity in HPV vaccination. That means that we have shown now that by giving the HPV vaccine, not only are the people who get the vaccine prevented from getting these cancers, it protects them, but we have shown that there is a decrease in cancer risk even in patients who have not been vaccinated. This concept of herd immunity is well known amongst infectious diseases in the uses of these vaccines. When you protect most of the people from flu, most of the people from measles, other infectious complications, you can actually protect people who haven't been vaccinated. Now we have data to show that this works for cancer as well. And therefore it's critically important that people follow the CDC guidelines and vaccinate their children when they're pre-pubescent, when they're 11 and 12 years old. If they haven't gotten the vaccine yet, they should get it as they get older in their teenage years or in their young adult years. And recently, in October of 2018, the Gardasil 9 vaccine has actually been recommended for adults up to the age of 45, both men and women. So this is an important vaccine for parents to know about, be aware of, and make sure that their children get this vaccine to prevent complications later in life. This vaccine is safe. Dr. Rosenfeld will speak to you about his experiences in having to give this vaccine to parents and children to explain to them what the specific concerns that they have, whether they're real or they're not real. But everybody needs to remember that this is a cancer-protecting vaccine. We can actually prevent cases of cancer by giving this vaccine 
And unfortunately, it's underutilized. We are seeing more and more of it being utilized, which is very good, but we're not seeing enough of it. So I'll turn the mic over to Dr. Rosenfeld now, talking about his vast experience in dealing with parents who are objecting, and why they're objecting to getting this and other vaccines. Good morning. It's interesting because as a marketing tool to say that we had a vaccine that prevents cancer, you would think people would be lining up at the door to come get immunized. And yet, as this poll shows, we haven't done as good a job as we thought we could. Now, this vaccine has been around for over a decade now, and things are getting better. But there's actually something heartening for me as a pediatrician in this poll. If we look at national statistics, <laughs> only about 50% of the eligible people who can get this vaccine have gotten it. And in this poll, we see two thirds of parents are talking about getting their children immunized. So whether the national statistics aren't as recent, since this was just done in November, and we're beginning to catch up and we're getting, beginning to do better and better at this, then perhaps the message is finally getting out there. So we seem to be doing a little bit better in the New York area and on Long Island than the rest of the country that doesn't mean that our work is completed and we don't have more to do. When we talk to parents, I think one of the great problems is that they are not aware or understanding of what this vaccine can do, how it works, what its side effects are, and whether this gets caught up in some of the other anti-vaccine uh, concerns that parents may have. Over 80 million doses of this vaccine have been given, and the number of severe side effects is essentially zero. There have been very, very, very few, a handful of cases that may be associated with 80 million people getting any complication that is serious. Like many shots, you get some soreness in your arm and some vocal tenderness. If you don't get fever, you don't feel malaise, you don't feel uh, sick from this and there are certainly no serious side effects. So letting parents know that this is safe, and I think parents, when a new vaccine comes out, they say, I don't want my child to be the first one. But perhaps if you say your child is gonna be the 80 million than one person getting the shot, that they are certainly more um, amenable to having these immunizations. And I think in the general pediatric community, as the pediatricians present this to their patients, fact that this has been given for so long and without any side effects um, really has been a strong point to take the message. I think the other issue about boys getting the shot is one that was a, wasn't originally there because it was originally for girls only, but we certainly realized that the rate of transmission and now we're seeing an increase in numbers of cancers that can be caused by HPV in the male population uh, this is certainly very important again, for the transmission of the disease and certainly also for the protection of the males in our society. I think one of the other issues is you're talking about a vaccine that, which is given at 11 and 12 years of age. And so a lot of parents, we don't necessarily talk to them when we talk about other immunizations but I think almost all pediatricians and practitioners who are giving immunizations, certainly at the time that kids are approaching puberty, this is a discussion they do have, and if they're not, they should do that and be able to help the parents and understand what a wonderful gift has been given with this vaccine. It's really, I, I just don't understand how any person said we may prevent a cancer in your child if they get two shots. Fabulous, fabulous proposition. I just want to reiterate also that Dr. Gladney, even though you don't get it when you're 11 or 12, there's still a benefit that decreases because as you get it being an adult, you may have already been exposed to the rich virus, but there is certainly protection and if people are not sexually active before they are, if they take this vaccine, they're going to get good protection from it. 
So it's a wonderful vaccine. It's safe. We need to give it to one of our sons and daughters. It's an appropriate time to do it, but that's not the last chance. And I would urge all parents uh, to think about this. People such as Janine are now in the community trying to educate people. And this is hard sometimes. People think they listen, but there's still some hidden years about this. Great education, pediatricians and educators getting the message out. And well, instead of having 66%, maybe we can be up to 95 or 100%. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Good morning. I just want to speak this morning about the patients I see. I see patients every day. I work in a GYN oncology practice, and we have women come in every day with abnormal PAPs because of the HPV. I would say 85% of our patients now have a PAP smear come back with either HPV low or high risk. A lot of these girls who have the virus do not know what the shot is. They're in their 20s or 30s. They never heard of it. Some say, I don't know if I got it. And then we also have the opportunity to see the parents. So every day on a daily basis, I do educate about the shot. I push this shot for anybody, any parent, our younger population of patients who are in their 20s, we tell them to talk to PMD. This is a shot you need to have. There's not many things in this world that can prevent cancer, but this is a shot that can prevent certain types of cancer. I have three sons, I'm the mother to three boys. All three of my sons have had this shot. I have two grandchildren. They will get the shot eventually. There's, we see so much. We see these girls go through so many procedures because of abnormal pap smears or because they have the HPV virus. Some parents will say, is this giving my, my child the permission to have sex? I feel like if they get this, well, then that's a ticket, though it's okay to have sex. You know, the discussion has to be had with the child. There's many other diseases you can contract if you become sexually active. This is just one thing that can help prevent something from causing a lot of problems later on in life. Okay, of course, we're open to questions. Anyone have any questions? Yes. Come on, come on up. Our experts, come on up. It's currently recommended but not required in order for, you know, for school-age children. Why is that if it's safe and effective and everybody should what? get it? So the question was, what about making this mandatory for school-age children when they reach 11 or 12 years old? So this is a political, legal type of question. It's not a medical question. From a medical point of view, it should be provided to every single person at the age of 11 or 12. The difference with this vaccine, for example, compared to other vaccines, is that you're going to cause somebody else potentially in that class to get an active infectious disease right then and there if you don't get vaccinated, for example, with measles. And here you're talking about a complication, a very serious complication called cancer, but it's not gonna happen that year, in that room, in that class, at least hopefully not. So as children become sexually active, this becomes more of a public health problem. But I think that the reason the politicians have chosen at this point not to make this mandatory is based upon the root of transmission and the likelihood of somebody else in that classroom being impacted by you right then and there not getting vaccinated. So with certain vaccines, that's a direct risk to the children sitting in that room at that moment. A classical example again is measles, for which we, in the midst of an epidemic right now in Washington, we've had an epidemic in New York and New Jersey and in many other places throughout Europe. This is a huge problem. And there it's very appropriate to mandate, from a public health point of view, vaccinate or don't come into class. Here the argument is different, but still an equally important argument should be made to vaccinate the children because of the future potential complications. Take through again the types of cancers that vaccine So we have very hard evidence to support the fact that HPV, which is the major cause of certain types of cervical and anal rectal carcinoma, can absolutely be prevented with the HPV vaccination. Human papillomavirus is present in those lesions, is the cause of those cancers. This is not that strange. We do find other areas of the body, for example, hepatitis C, where the hepatitis C virus clearly causes cancer. So, 
This is actually a paradigm. We do think that there are what we call oncogenic viruses. These are viruses that are capable of causing mutations and cancer in the human body. HPV is probably one of the best understood, the most well known, and the first one that we really have a vaccine to prevent cancer. And Dr. Rosenthal said it's an amazing thing that we have a vaccine that prevents cancer and people aren't jumping to get it taken. There are other areas in the body where HPV can also cause cancer, specifically pharyngeal or laryngeal carcinomas. The thought is that this will also protect potentially against those types of cancers, but those are rarer and we don't have as much data to show that and demonstrate that conclusively. But certainly it would be a side benefit of these vaccines that would be a wonderful additional benefit beyond the already great benefit of preventing cervical and anal carcinoma. There was, there was backlash though when the vaccine <clears throat> first came out, which is why there's such a hard sell, the commercials, did you know, mom, right, when it goes backwards in time. So what were the complications? You're saying it was a handful, but there was public outcry against the vaccine for a reason. So I think the major public outcry was addressed by my colleagues, and that's the concern that this will, quote, license sexual behavior, sexual activity earlier than would otherwise be undertaken. So I would totally separate out any connection between this vaccine enhancing or increasing sexual activity and what the vaccine does. Every parent, every appropriate person should be having conversations with their children prior to them becoming sexually active. Whatever your personal mores, your personal religious values, your personal ethical values, you should be imparting those to your children because regardless of what your feelings are about young children and sexual activity, they need to be made aware of the dangers of sexual activity that can cause numerous sexually transmitted diseases, unwanted pregnancies, other complications. And every parent needs to have that conversation with their child, pediatricians, other healthcare professionals, guidance counselors at school, etc. We need to educate our children about what is and what is not healthy, good, appropriate sexual activity, and at what age that should begin, and under what circumstances that should begin. There isn't one answer fits all for that. Different religion, different ethnic backgrounds, different personal views on the subject. Every parent needs to make sure that their views are imparted to their children. That has, in my opinion, absolutely nothing to do with the HPV vaccination. Because regardless of what your child may or may not be doing now, you have no idea what they'll be doing 10 years from now. And you have no idea who their partners are and what their partners may or may not have been doing. And therefore, this is a very good public health tool that can be given to children that will hopefully follow your advice and not engage in sexual activity until you and they think that it's appropriate. But that has nothing to do with the value of giving the vaccine because whenever it is appropriate for them to become sexually active, whether that's only after marriage with their spouse, that still will be a potential benefit to them because you don't know what activities they or their spouse will be doing 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. And therefore, the two, in my opinion, are totally unrelated. What are the most serious complications from this? If I do remember, weren't there lawsuits originally? So I'm not familiar with the lawsuits that you're referring to. But Dr. Rogenfeld, maybe you want to come up and, and address this. This is a very safe vaccine, as he already mentioned. Uh, there really aren't a lot of causally related complications of this vaccine being given to people. So the uh, federal government has a vaccine related registry. So all vaccines, uh, once they're first marketed and then at any time when a vaccine is associated with a serious illness, it is supposed to be reported to the government. Uh, prior to this, I looked the other day, and I think there have been 12 or 13 documented cases of serious cases of illness associated with 80 million doses of this vaccine. It is among the lowest rate, and I, I don't want to say the lowest rate, I mean, but I, I don't think there's any other vaccine that has as good a safety record as the HPV. 
and almost all of the side effects that are listed are relatively minor and going along with the um, pain in the arm where the shot is given. I think originally it was an entirely different story when this vaccine was first introduced. Uh, I do not hear the business of it being uh, promoting promiscuity anymore as much as I used to. That was something that uh, was certainly touted and people were worried about the MRA and then the stories that we looked on the internet that there's always somebody complaining about something. None of those cases really panned out to be a problem or a problem associated with the vaccine. And I think that as time has gone on, we're hearing fewer arguments, one about sexual activity, and two, when any new vaccine, there's just some parents who are much more cautious. I'm not saying that that's a bad strategy to take as a parent. You want your child to be the first one you may. But some parents are more cautious and say, I want there to be a long, firm history before I'm willing to say that this vaccine is safe. And I think that's been established now. The parents can go to a reliable site, not to an anti-vaccine site, but if they go to the government site, they'll find this is an extremely safe vaccine. I hope that answers the question. So if you get it before the age of 13, it's two doses, and I believe it's a year apart, so that they give two doses. One of the problems has been our children are not fully vaccinated until they get both doses. And sometimes, again, you have parents who give one dose, and teenage patients don't necessarily go for routine visits every year, and they can miss uh, the second dose. So that's been another problem, not only getting one dose, but after 13, because the immune system does not react in the same way, and you need to have three doses to completely uh, make sure that the vaccination is working. I'll just add one thing, that if you didn't get your doses at those ages, it's not too late to get them. Certainly, if it's prior to the onset of sexual activity, while your immune system may not be as active you need the three doses, it should be just as effective in terms of preventing any exposure to HPV. Once you're sexually active, there is the potential that you'll be exposed to some of the strains of the HPV that are out there, but you still will get protection if you haven't been exposed to the other strains that are present in the virus. So there is a benefit, and that's why the government has now, the FDA has approved this vaccine even up to the age of 45. So a person should not say, I'm too old to necessarily get the vaccine. Their personal lifestyles at a point in time might make it appropriate for a person who's older than 26 to get the vaccination. Whereas other people who may be in a different relationship will say, no, it's less appropriate, less beneficial for me based upon my risk factors to get the vaccine. But when you're 11 or 12 years old, you don't know what your risk factors will be. And for such a significant percentage of the population in the United States having this. Almost 80 million to 90 million people are known to have this in the United States right now. So this is a huge public health potential problem and a huge potential group of people that could expose you. So therefore, it's highly recommended that this vaccine be given at the appropriate younger age before sexual activity starts. Another point that should be made there is a high prevalence in the population, 80 or 90 million people. Most people who have infection with HPV are asymptomatic. They have no recognition that they have the disease. So it's not as if people could go and say that I, I want to be treated for it, I know I have it, and, uh, take precautions against it. Most people, many, many people have it, and many people absolutely have no symptoms so they don't know that they can transmit the virus from one person to another. Yeah, anything else you want to add from the perspective of somebody on the front lines at the Cancer Center? I just think that education, it's got to come from education from the pediatricians, from group forums that go out in the community, and parents need to be educated more that this can prevent a cancer later on for their children. 
Sorry, Dr. Rosewell, did you want to share any insights from that study that you pulled? Uh, so in the uh, latest journal of uh, pediatrics, which is the official journal of the Academy of Pediatrics, uh, they were asking the question, why haven't pediatricians been able to increase the amount of the vaccination that's present? And what is it that would help the community to better understand this and better accept the vaccine? And when they talk to parents about this, parents don't react in a positive way to, you must have this vaccine, it's very urgent. Your child is in grave danger. If you don't get it now, something terrible is going to happen to them. That's not a positive message that seems to be resonating with the general population. Most people in what this survey showed need education. They want to hear about the vaccine. They want to hear about the safety profile. They want to hear about why boys need this vaccine. And so being more positive about the positive effects rather than using scare tactics seems to be something that we should use in our messaging. I hope we're getting that across today. We don't want to scare anybody. We want to urge them to do something that they can use to help themselves and their families. Thank you. Any other questions? We do have the full results of the Truth in Medicine poll on South Nassau's uh, website. Uh, also, a full copy of the press release, which goes into uh, some additional details on our uh, on our website and also on our Facebook page uh, uh, later today. Any other questions from the media? Any other questions at all? Thank you. All right. Very good. Thank you. And our experts are available for one-on-ones if you want. <laughs>